today we will start off our discussion on peripheral nerve sheet tumors. This is a common group of tumors actually. In fact, most of your soft tissue tumors that you get in clinical practice will probably come from this and from the smooth muscle and skeletal muscle kind of lineages. So there are a few entities which we'll see first, the ones which are common, and we'll talk about the DDs within that particular group also. So let's start off with one uncommon one among the benign entities, that is the solitary circumscribed neuroma. So basically the history will be of that of a face kind of a lesion, face lesion or in the oral cavity, maybe in the cheek. So it would be a slow growing kind of a lesion over a period of maybe a few months. And what we'll have is a very small, well circumscribed kind of a nodule, which is as such on a higher power, you don't really see anything very scary. The, it's in ho kind of small holes, small holes and in packets, spindle cells. What you see is there's a lot of clefting going on. In between the individual packets also, there's a lot of clefts, which are probably not artifactual as you see. At a higher power, you see the spindle cells growing in kinds of holes all over. And then you have got this uh, kind of spaces, this kind of clefts actually here. Yeah. So this clefting spaces with the packets or the holes of these spindle cells are what is seen in this particular tumor. So these clefts are pretty much conspicuous. And you see that there is not any kind of, a, I mean, there's no specific pattern basically. It's just small holes and small packets of cells. And the cells as such are bland. They're innocuous, spindle with some amount of fibrillary cytoplasm. There's not much palisading or any other sign that it's a schwannoma. Okay, so here you have those bland, slightly Schwannian cells, a bit of zigzag wavy contour over here. So at a higher power, that is how the cells will look. They look fusiform to spindle, elongated with, can you appreciate the fibrilliness of, uh, of this cytoplasm? For the first years, when you have this kind of slightly, what should I say, not a uniform kind of as if there are small fibrils within the cytoplasm, that is what we call a fibrillary cytoplasm. It applies in the case of glial tumors as well as in the case of peripheral nerve sheet tumors. There is no, there is no atypia, there is no mitosis is what is important. So that's all there is to this particular entity. It will be mostly in the skin of the head and uh, I mean over the nasolabial folds, over the nose and also in the cheek. There is no association with any kind of syndrome. It is completely benign and uh, it's a well circumscribed dermal nodule sometimes can extend up to the subcutis. There'll be a very thin peripheral capsule of perineurium. In this particular case, if we go back, you see there's a, there's a kind of a thin capsule which was separated out from that main tumor actually. So there's a perineural sheath. So other than that, you have got the bland Schwannian cells with buckled wavy nuclei in short fascicles, bundles, and this clefting artifact is characteristic of this particular entity. About the IHC, you don't really need an IHC, but uh, if you want to do, you will do the usual markers for this peripheral nerve sheath family, S100 protein, SOX10, which will uh, I mean, show that these cells are positive for that. There is also a layer of perineurial cells which are forming the capsule-like structure. So those will stain with EMA, epithelial membrane antigen, which is one of the markers for this perineurial cell group. And often, if you are lucky, sometimes you will get a nerve twig which is connected to this particular tumor. So that's it. Uh, this one doesn't have too many of differentials, obviously, as you have seen, it's a very well circumscribed thing. At most, you can have a problem with the schwannoma. Schwannomas usually have a more proper capsule and they usually have more appreciable Veroque body formation. For the, uh, for the juniors who are just starting out, Veroque body and the Antony AB will be coming on shortly. So this I'm just including for the sake of our DD, I'm just talking about it now. Uh, you get to see a lot of hyalinized vessels also, microcystic changes and all those like kind of changes that you see in the Antony B regions, which are not seen over here. Mucosal neuroma, that might be a DD, especially if it's in the cheek, in the oral cavity, because neuromas are also known to occur in the oral cavity. There, the proliferation is not that well organized, actually. It is kind of haphazard nerve bundles, which will be spread throughout. So it is not such a discrete, well organized proliferation in a case of mucosal neuroma and differentiation of a solitary circumscribed neuroma from a mucosal neuroma, however, is very important because as we know, mucosal neuromas are one of the pointers to a uh, main syndrome, especially in the case of men to be, they are one of the important, uh, the, I mean, one of the important criteria for diagnosis. So before signing out anything as a mucosal neuroma, we need to be sure whether it is really one. 
traumatic neuroma. Sometimes there might be a history of trauma over that region, in which case there will be an overgrowth. There will be a reactive overgrowth of these nerve bundles, but even there it will be haphazard. It will not be such a well-organized kind of an entity as in this case. Plexiform neurofibroma is mentioned in the book as a differential. It does not usually come in. It will only come in as a differential if your solitary circumscribed neuroma is not solitary, if it is multiple. It can happen sometimes in a case of a neuroma also, but it is uncommon. In that case, a plexiform neurofibroma will come into the differential, but it's not really an important differential. Clinically, we are mostly concerned about a schwannoma and most importantly, prognostically, for a mucosal neuroma. Now coming to the big one, schwannoma. This is something that should be known inside out by all pathologists actually. All the variants, all the histological features that we are expected to see because we will come across this particular entity in many kinds of forms and at many different places. So we should know about the variations mostly. So schwannoma as such we all know, it's a very well circumscribed encapsulated kind of a tumor which uh, if we see at a lower power, it, the impression that it gives is it's got a kind of a dimorphic appearance. One area will look cellular, the other area will look less cellular. And uh, in this particular case, this is an example of a cellular schwannoma. So the cellularity overall is more. But if you see towards the center, you are having large vessels which are kind of congested and dilated as well. So those are changes which are seen in the Antony B area. Okay. So we will talk about the Antony A and the Antony B area. As of now, we will see that this particular tumor is actually an encapsulated tumor, very well circumscribed. There is no infiltration into the adjacent fat. This is from the, can you identify the place from which this has been taken? I don't know whether the, you can make out at this particular magnification on your screen, if it's a mobile screen. Can you see a lining? No. Which GI tract. GI tract? Yeah, it's the stomach actually, because you might not be able to make out at this smaller this thing, but it's from the stomach. I just showed this particular thing for one important feature. In the stomach, like stomach is one of the sites where the schwannoma is not encapsulated. It will be well circumscribed, but there will be no capsule. The other important feature is in the stomach, you will always have a peripheral rim of lymphoid follicles outside the border of the schwannoma. That's an important differential diagnostic feature. If for the PGs, if you get a gastric schwannoma, which is kept for your spotter or for discussion, if you see a bland spindle cell proliferation with an idea of slight verrocaying with this kind of proper lymphoid follicle formation towards the, I mean, towards this periphery, schwannoma should be in your differential. So this is the outside capsule and then going inside. Can you see the palisading at this power itself? I've actually focused such an area where you can appreciate this. I'm uh, asking the senior. Yes. So yes, sir. The, yeah. So the palisading is very obvious over here. Sometimes you will not get so obvious palisading, but you see that this is the cellular zone basically where you are getting the palisading. Moving inside, you are having zones that are a bit less cellular and which have lots of congested vessels. So that's another part of this tumor. So you have got two parts. One is the Antony A. One is the Antony B. There are two areas which are seen in this tumor. So here you see a nice kind of a regimentation as if the tumor cells are forming rows and in between that there is a fibrillary zone which is anucleate where there is nothing. So this is what we call the palisading and the characteristic varroche body which is seen in the case of the schwannoma. Okay, so this is the Antony A area. Over here the pattern is more kind of diffuse, dispersed. So this is a nice example of varroche body formation, palisading. Over here However, we see that the cellularity is a bit more and the pattern is more, it's going more in the form of intersecting fascicles actually. And the palisading is not that obvious. The Antony B region is admixed with this area. It is almost in close proximity and blending with this cellular region. And as we see, there has been a lot of hemorrhage extending from the Antony B region into this area, which is why you have all these hemosiderin. Is it appreciable on the screen? These dark clumps? Yes, sir. Clumps. So there's a lot of hemosiderin over there and you have these intersecting fascicles for the for the first years this is what you would call an intersecting fascicles at some places you might even call it vaguely storyform okay if you see it at a higher power again the cells are bland mildly hyperchromatic pretty much uniform and uh, there is no overlapping not much of an overlapping there is no evidence of mitotic access so that's how the usual schwannoma will look I have intentionally shown the cells which are not characteristically Schwannian because actually 
all of us who are practicing know that that most of the time we don't get to see those wavy buckled nuclei what we get to see is kind of elongated ovoid fusiform cells with the fibrillariness of the cytoplasm the buckle zigzag appearance can be seen sometimes but often it will come without the buckling so i want to stress on that thing at the end actually this the kind of wavy zigzag nature of the particular nucleus is an important clue but you will often not get a wavy zigzag kind of a contour as far as the nucleus is concerned so over here you see these are relatively plump slightly fusiform cells but the fibrillariness of the, of their cytoplasm is appreciable even at this power you get a kind of fibrillariness of the cytoplasm there is a lot of hemosiderite in the background however the the cells are bland you have a bit of a pinpoint nucleolus but otherwise it's pretty much normal chromatic uniform there's no coarse clumping of chromatin there's no nuclear irregularity mitosis or any other scary feature basically so this is the thing for the first years this is the kind of a cell that you often look out for if you are trying to pin this particular feature onto a schwannian thing see this zigzag kind of a nature slightly serpentine appearance of the nucleus so this waviness this waviness of the cytoplasm is one important clue towards it being a schwannian cell so that if you are seeing that well and good but sometimes you will not get to appreciate this waviness zigzag nature of the nucleus okay so again here you are seeing this zigzaginess of the nucleus over here for the first years these are basically just nerve fascicles which have been caught in transverse sections which is why you get them as rounded okay so basically don't think of them as another group of cells these are basically just nerve bundles which have been cut in the other plane over here now we go into the antony b region which is the area where you will not get that much of cells you will get a whole lot of other changes you will get microcystic changes you will get hemorrhage you will get edema you will get thrombosis within the vessels and you will even have organizing thrombi so we see all of that over here the cellularity as such is less but even here there's a bit of a verroqua body formation if you see the one that i'm circling around could be a bit of a kind of a palisaded appearance okay and there's a lot of microcystic changes meaning that this edema is slightly vague cystic kind of an appearance in the background lot of this congested large vessels which you'll get to see and this particular thing i will show it in subsequent slides for the sake of the juniors because this is one important feature uh which we'll sometimes get to see in angiomatous lesions and in that case you need to identify that particular thing okay so that's all we are seeing over here this is the antony b region so you have this congested large vessel with thick walled smaller vessels as well and slightly microcystic edematous kind of an appearance now this is for the first year just have a look this is a vessel basically this is a vessel in which you are not able to make out the outlines because it has bled for a long period of time and because of the bleeding again that thing is happening so because of the bleeding what what is happening over there inside are you able to see those like some of those pink zones within the vessel as if it's forming channels primitive channels within the vessel so we'll go into it at a higher power so basically what has happened is so this is your vessel lining basically upashana has some doubt okay yeah Oh, yeah tell the no doubt sir oh okay so i don't know what is this okay i mean let's just ignore this particular thing what we are seeing is you have got a vessel wall basically you have got a vessel wall you have got this endothelial lining basically towards the bottom of the screen and then you have all this fibrinoid kind of a material this is basically the organized fibrin which has happened from the bleeding which has happened priorly and then are you seeing this particular channel of endothelium cells again rimming this fibrinoid area within the vessel yes sir so that's an organizing within thrombus yeah so that's an organizing thrombus basically this is for the juniors to identify basically you get that sometimes also in the case of vascular tumors organizing thrombi so that's how an organizing thrombus will look this is basically recanalization going on slowly just a minute let me just close this and again share it back
Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay. So the organizing thrombus has been seen, but remember that sometimes even in the Antony A area, you won't get verrucoing. Instead of that, what you will get is long fascicles, which are intersecting with each other, where you will not have much of a clue as far as the Schwannian nature is concerned, because you are not getting to see verruca bodies. So that's also common. Cellular schwannomas are known to exist, where you don't get much of verruca body formation. So this is something like this. So you have got these intersecting fascicles, which are joining with each other. Again, there are nerve fascicles which have been caught in transverse section so they appear roundish so here you are seeing this elongated spindle fusiform cells with pinpoint nucleoli but not much pleomorphism or not much uh, kind of hyper i mean coarse like coarse chromatin condensation either again not much of mitosis either so up to around two to three mitosis per 10 hyperfills can be seen in the case of cellular schwannoma but anything more than that you need to worry you need to worry whether you are getting some other kind of a nerve sheet tumor, some other malignant nerve sheet tumor. S100 protein, of course, we know that S100 and, and this SOX10 are the trademark IHC hallmarks of this particular group of tumors. So S100 is very strongly expressed. Juniors will need to know the pattern of expression of, of this S100. Actually, you will have to have a small notebook with the names of markers and with the pattern of expression. That is very important. Starting from which particular marker localizes to the nucleus, which one to the cytoplasm, which to both, which to the membrane, things like that. So S100 is one characteristic one which in this particular group localizes both to the nucleus as well as to the cytoplasm. So that's an important thing to be kept in mind. Retropaternal schwannomas. Retropaternal schwannomas can grow to huge sizes. They can grow to giant sizes and they can show a whole lot of changes which are not seen in a normal peripheral schwannoma. We'll have to talk about that. Many of these schwannomas will show striking amount of degenerative atypia. They will show like, like so much of atypia, you will start to think of a soft tissue sarcoma, but that's expected. Those, uh, so those schwannomas are also known as ancient schwannomas. Those are basically ancient changes which happen in any long-standing schwannoma, which has stayed hidden inside the abdominal cavity for a long period of time. So the first important thing is there, the Antony B areas often tend to be much more well-developed. So you will get a lot of microcystic change. You will get a lot of congested vessels. You will also get preserved spindle cell elements like you've seen over here towards the left hand of the screen. Within the spindle cell elements, however, you see in this particular focus, there's not much pleomorphism. There's not much atypia. It's the usual kind of Schwannian cells going around. But in the microcystic zones, you are not seeing those cells. You're getting all kinds of congested vessels, microcystic edematous appearance, and also hemocytin showing that it has bled before. Again, the same microcystic appearance with congested vessels. S100 is uniformly and strongly positive, just as it is expected in the case of any schwannoma. Okay, see this, beautiful. This is a nuclear positivity as well as cytoplasmic positivity. So that is the kind of positivity that you expect to see in these cells. You have a lot of necrosis basically, which just looks like, like discrete amorphous zones. You don't see the tumor cells blending into it as we have seen, seen before as in the case of coagulative necrosis. You don't get that. So you have just these discrete zones without any tumor cells whatsoever. And adjacent to that, you have small amounts of residual viable kind of the cells, which are again bland, not much of ATP is seen over there. Very bland, innocuous looking cells. Seeing the inclusion, internuclear inclusion towards the five o'clock position. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's one change that can be sometimes seen in the case of schwannomas, especially in the case of retroperitoneal schwannomas. So that's an important feature. S100 positive, will, again, it will show strong kind of positivity. So this is the thing that I was talking about. This Sometimes this particular retroperitoneal schwannomas will show striking amounts of atypia. They will show bizarreness almost. So we need to take that in the context. So if we are having any kind of a tumor that fits the other points as far as the Schwannian nature is concerned, that is the Antony B areas we are satisfied with, plus the S100 is giving us a characteristic kind of a pattern which is Schwannian and all the other markers are negative, we can ascribe these things to an ancient change basically. So this atypia, this kind of bizarreness is, is nothing worrisome. You just don't expect to see mitosis in that background. If on top of this bizarreness, you start to get mitosis, then you start to get worried whether you are missing out on any other soft tissue sarcoma, basically. So here you're seeing all these atypical bizarre kind of cells. 
So again, very busy slide. I'm just going to touch over the minor details. Uh, schwannoma is the commonest peripheral nerve sheet tumor that you will get. Uh, the age group is Okay, so just a minute. Dr. Anshu is having some problem joining. I have admitted her, but I don't think she's able to get in. Okay. So the deep locations, you'll get them in the retroperitoneum, posterior mediastinum also. So those sites also, also will be kept in mind. These are usually less than five centimeter unless you get them in the abdominal cavity, in which case they can grow to be large. This can also show cystic change, hemorrhage, etc. You will get antony A areas, you will get antony B areas. Mitosis is usually low. Long-standing lesions can show degenerative changes, nuclear atypia, ancient change, but there will be no increase in mitotic activity. What about ISC? Diffuse strong S100 and nuclear SOX10 positivity. This nuclear H3K27ME3. This should be known by the PGs actually. This is a new marker which has come out and which is supposed to be negative, which is negative in the case of malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors. So that's expressed in these particular cases because these are not malignant. Uh, just like any other bizarre tumor, sometimes with an epithelioid nature, in the retroperitoneum, they can express pan -CK. So just going by pan -CK, we cannot exclude this particular group of tumors. GFAP, as we know, like the Schwann cells can sometimes also express GFAP. What are the differential diagnoses? In the peripheral regions, you can have a neurofibroma, but then neurofibromas will not have a proper capsule like that. Plus there is no organization per se into antony A and antony B. Plus they usually have less amount of cellularity compared to a Schwannoma. Whereas in the deeper sites, especially with the ancient schwannomas, you will have an issue with malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, in which case the most important is to look for mitosis. Start to look for mitosis and also for areas which are so cellular that I mean, that the cells almost will seem to like go and sit upon each other. So if there is a hypercellularity along with mitotic activity, you need to be worried. And also keep in mind that S100 and SOX10, these markers that were very strongly and uniformly positive in schwannoma, will be expressed in a very patchy fashion and in a very uh, indistinct kind of a fashion in the case of malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors. So if you have a strong expression of these markers, then probably you are not dealing with MPNST. This is one thing that needs to be kept in mind. And loss of nuclear H3K27 ME3 is something which is seen in the case of MPNST and is not seen in the schwannomas. Also, sometimes in a very cellular schwannoma, you will have a differential diagnosis of a spindle cell melanoma, especially if it is deep in the skin. If it is very cellular, if there is no varroca body formation, plus if you have some more amount of atypia compared to what you get in the case of a normal schwannoma with prominent nucleoli and a bit of mitosis here and there, you will start, you will need to start thinking about a spindle cell melanoma, which can almost mimic the same kind of an appearance. Very important is to look into the overlying epidermis. Usually a melanoma will give you some kind of a hint as far as the epidermis is concerned. There will be some kind of a lentiginous proliferation or there will be some amount of junctional activity which will give you a clue. S100 and SOX10 will not really help you because S100 will also be positive in that particular group. HMB45 and melan A might be negative in a spindle cell melanoma. So in that case, your clinical correlation plus the epidermis is a very important feature, plus along with the important features like atypia, along with mitosis. So these are the important differentials which need to be kept in mind. Coming to neurofibroma, now let's just go straight away into the tumor. So you are having this epidermis. Below that, as you can see, in the somewhat lower down in the papillary dermis, you are having this very well circumscribed kind of a proliferation, but no capsule. And what you are seeing, you are seeing this zigzag wavy kind of wormy like cells which are scattered in the background which is more which is kind of collagenized it's kind of hyalinized and this is the characteristic collagen actually if you have if you see a spindle cell tumor which is posicellular and which there is this particular kind of a collagen which is characteristically called by enzinger as shredded carrot i think that is a very apt description you take carrot and you shred it with a grater and that's the kind of like like collagen that you expect to see right very thin fibrils which are not really organized into broad zones. Okay, so this kind of wired is shredded carrot kind of collagen with this kind of Schwannian cells, 
with a bit of fibrillariness to their cytoplasm. That's all that you will get to see in the case of a conventional neurofibroma. These are usually superficial conventional neurofibromas. That's what we expect. So nothing very serious about this, except that it's just to keep in mind that it's well circumscribed, it's possicellular, there's a characteristic type of a collagen. Often they will have mast cells also as a part of the population within the tumor. And you will have this possicellular proliferation of spindle cells, which are bland. S100 will pick up positivity in these cells, but again, it will be less intense compared to that of schwannoma, simply because of the fact that they don't have that many cells. Whatever cells are there will stain for S100. Now coming to the next one, these are actually the more important ones as far as our clinical perspectives are concerned. Diffuse neurofibroma. All neurofibromas are not created equal. There are some which are actually bad and which can lead on to even worse things. So we'll talk about diffuse neurofibroma and plexiform neurofibroma. These are the most important variants which need to be recognized. Uh, they need to be kept in your differential as far as the low grade spindle cell proliferation is concerned, especially if it is somewhere starting off from close to the epidermal surface. So this is what you have. You have the skin lining epidermis, which is kind of pushed out and it is attenuated. And then you see that the entire space between the superficial dermis up to the subcutis has been kind of obliterated by a process. We don't know what kind of a process, but whatever process it is, it is giving a uniform look from the top to the bottom going up to the subcutis. Now going to a higher power, we see that there is a proliferation of cells. We are not able to make out, but what is obvious is that there is an entrapment of the subcutaneous tissue, right? The adipocytic elements can be seen over here, which are trapped between the cellular elements. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So now we go into the next, into a higher power, and we see that there are cells which are basically infiltrating through the adipose tissue, which are small. And at that power itself, we have an idea that these are probably not spindle. They don't give the spindle thing. Rather, they give us an impression of being round, slightly roundish. Let's see at a higher power and that's how it is. There are a few spindle cells, but you are getting a sizable proportion of cells which are round, right? If you look in. Now contrast this to the spindle Schwannian type of cells that we have seen before. The cells look different. They are spindle, but they are also round. That's one very important clue to understanding a diffuse neurofibroma. You will often not get the conventional Schwannian kind of spindle cells. They will be more rounded. Okay, so round along with a bit of spindle cells. Think about that. And... As you see, these are very bland. These are innocuous. There's no atypia. There's no mitotic axis even. But just like as in case of dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, it is not the mitosis or the atypia that we are seeing. It is the infiltrativeness. These are going deep down and these are infiltrating the adipose tissue. So that is the worrisome bit about these deep-seated diffuse neurofibromas. See, this is another case where there has been a total entrapment, almost in a DFSP-like fashion, except for the fact that dermatofibrosarcomas usually have a more prominent storyform pattern. Here, the pattern is more like a diffuse sheet, which is going in. But the entrapment, this kind of entrapment of whole bundles of adipocytes is also seen in the case of a DFSP, which is why sometimes we'll also have a DFSP in our differential and we'll put a CD34 along with our S100. So here you have this entrapment of these individual adipocytes by this bland, innocuous, slightly fusiform to rounded cells, which are otherwise bland. Again, this is another case where the process starts off from the reticular dermis and goes on entrapping the adipocytic elements down into the subcutis. You can see the infiltration of these adnexal elements as well, these, these ducts, these sweat ducts basically. Okay, so you are having these entrapped, entrapped adipocytes with the same kind of haphazardly dispersed sheets of these rounded cells. So they don't give you much of a Schwannian clue, actually. They are just nondescript round cells. But if you look at that pattern, you'll, you should always have a diffuse neurofibroma as one of your differentials, along with the DFSP. Again, this was another case where, this was another case where, as you see, uh, the deeper down, there is an entrapment. This has been marked out on the slide, these areas. So basically, there are some changes which are seen over here, which will be seen at a higher power. So are you able to see the skeletal muscle bundles over here? And these are again infiltrated by these tumoral elements. This entire bundle, which is caught in transverse sections. These are the skeletal muscle elements. We'll see that at a higher power. So see, see the beautiful striations. I don't know if it's uh, like, if it is visible on your screen, my screen is big, so I can appreciate the striations. Visible, sir. visible no? Beautiful yes, striations, very, very well done. 
uh, slide. So you see the entrapment of the skeletal muscle bundles. For the first years, this is how you will identify a skeletal muscle bundle. Between a skeletal muscle and a smooth muscle bundle, if you see these striations, it has to be skeletal. So, this is the, uh, so there is this entrapment by the spindle to rounded cells. Nice striations which are seen. So there is this entrapping elements. And you do an S100 and it will be strongly positive. Okay, so this strong S100 positivity is one thing which goes in its favor of a diffuse neurofibroma. See, nicely the skeletal muscle elements are getting infiltrated in between by these S100 positive elements. So again, beautiful nuclear as well as cytoplasmic positivity, just the kind that we expect in a Schwann cell. MITF, microthalmia associated transcription factor, characteristically known in the case of melanoma, but these are also expressed in the case of the in the case of nuclei of skeletal muscles. So see this beautiful contrast. They did it to exclude a melanoma basically. So it picked out this particular nuclei as an internal control, internal positive control, and showed that these cells are negative. Very nicely done. Coming to the next entity, plexiform neurofibroma. For the first years, I guess you have seen some beggars waiting in the railway station who have these huge deformed lumps hanging over their body. So that's the kind of thing that we expect to see. These are basically plexiform neurofibromas and if present, they are important diagnostic hallmark of a syndrome known as neurofibromatosis 1. So if you get a, if you get a peripheral nerve sheet tumor, you will have to mug up all the features of neurofibromatosis 1 and also know about the genetics of it because that will automatically come as the next question. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about that. You see that like characteristically in association with NF1, what I'm going to talk about is the histology. So even at a lower power, what we are seeing over here is this interesting thing. Above, you don't have much of a thing going on except for the fact that there might be a spindle cell proliferation towards the top, but then work your way deeper down and you see that there are this kind of plexiform nodules, right? These slightly pale kind of nodules, which are haphazardly present, but throughout the entire deep dermis and going well into the subcutaneous fat. So such plexiform nodules, whenever you see in the deep dermis and extending into the subcutis, you don't have too many differentials actually. Plexiform neurofibroma is the number one differential. Plexiform schwannoma is also another differential, but that is relatively uncommon. I have I have specifically not talked about plexiform schwannoma in that discussion, in this discussion, because this is going to be a primer about the common entities. If needed, we can talk about it some other day. There is an entity known as plexiform schwannoma, just to keep in mind. So we'll now work our way into this particular plexiform nodules and see what is going on within these nodules. So basically you have got these plexiform nodules, I mean, which are infiltrating into the adipose tissue. If you see within this plexiform nodules, so these are basically nothing but expanded nerve bundles. These are like caricatures of nerve bundles where you are having a lot of proliferation of the endo, endonuclear cells, which are rimmed by the perineural elements. So these are basically enlarged nerve bundles with a lot of cellular activity going on within them. So if you see, again, there, there is this kind of hazard proliferation of the Schwannian cells, which you see subsequently at a higher power. As Hello. You see, Yeah. Okay, so you have this proliferation of the Schwannian kind of cells, which we'll see at a higher power. Basically, you're seeing that within these nodules, within this plexiform nodules, there's not much actually, there's not much going on. It is not a very cellular nodule. You are having spindle cells and you are having the collagen, just like what you would expect in the case of a diffuse, uh, in the case of a conventional neurofibroma. Okay, so you are having this collagen, you are having these bland Schwannian cells, which however are also giving us a slight kind of a zigzag kind of an appearance, just like as you see in the case of a conventional neurofibroma. There's nothing really scary. The cells are bland. There's no mitotic excess or anything of that sort. So this was one case. This is another case, basically the same. You are having these plexiform nodules going deep down. And if you see within, this is a relatively more cellular plexiform nodule basically. This is, as you can see, it's more blue some places. So there's a lot more cellularity over here. The cellularity within these nodules can, I mean, can be actually like variable. It can be less or it can be more as is seen over here. Here it is kind of going in a fascicular fashion, but you see this wavy zigzag kind of a nuclei. Bland, no mitotic activity whatsoever. Sometimes, and this is very important, especially in the setting Especially in the setting of a neurofibromatosis one, you can often get the two combined. 
you can get a diffuse neurofibroma and on top of it you can get a plexiform neurofibroma so it's identifiable you are getting to see the diffuse neurofibroma over here right there's a lot of expansion of the subcutis there's a lot of expansion of the subcutaneous space with the diffuse element and towards the left hand of the screen you are seeing the plexiform nodule within the plexiform nodule you are getting to see a lot of mixoid change there is the collagen and there is a small amount of preserved cellular element which is seen towards the center of this plexiform nodule this is the neurofibromatous element which is basically outside this is basically around the hair follicle okay you see the schwannian nature of the cells okay and within the diffuse areas you are getting cells which are like what do you see in the case of a diffuse neurofibroma small rounded to slightly elongated fusiform cells bland now comes the most important thing plexiform neurofibromas are very often known to undergo malignant change so whenever you identify a plexiform neurofibroma always play always pay attention to what is going on within the plexiform nodules apply all your criteria for diagnosis of a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor which you do otherwise within these nodules which means we'll have to pay attention to the cellularity we'll have to pay attention to the mitotic activity those are the most important things we need to see so even at this power and if you remember what we have seen priorly you can see that these nodules are much more blue right compared to what we have seen priorly they are plexiform all right they are going deep down in fact if you have a contrast actually towards the left you have got a conventional plexiform nodule to the extreme left and see the ones towards the right don't they look more blue yes sir okay so there is obviously uh, so there are uh, like there are basically subtle clues of malignancy which you can pick up at a scanner view itself the pink versus blue is a very good analogy whenever you see a lot of blue in something which is supposed to be pink you know there is something going on in those areas so we will basically see what's happening in those areas so here you have got a nice plexiform conventional nodule towards your left and you have got the blue cellular nodules towards the right so this is the conventional plexiform nodule this is the blue element let's see within the conventional plexiform nodule first so you are having this spindle to stellate cells but if you see there's a bit more of hyperchromasia right compared to the bland nature which you are seeing before these look a bit more dark this look slightly more atypical compared to what we have seen in the case of a conventional neurofibroma of course this would i mean this is not something by which we can label it malignant but there is a worry there is a worry that these cells are not really good right is more hyperchromatic and also this stellateness you see the stellate appearance is not what we get to see in a normally in the case of a neurofibroma so whenever there is a change from the normal kind of morphology of any conventional spindle cell element along with things like hyperchromasia start to worry start to look for other things and now going into the larger nodules which are totally blue we see that obviously the cellularity is very very high compared to what we have seen before and even at this power the atypi is quite appreciable the cells are pretty much atypical they are hyperchromatic there is pleomorphism okay so and if you see there's a bit of a veroke body formation also right from going from the 6 o'clock position towards the center one area where there's a slight verokeing i felt it's a verokeing i don't know whether you you feel it like that it looks like a regimented row with some kind of a separation so it might look like veroke body formation sometimes it's not a proper veroke body okay here so here somewhere towards the top right so again kind of haphazard yes. fascicles haphazard fascicles so this veroke body is important in context actually mane just don't let it totally mislead you it is schwannian probably there is something which which causes the cells to arrange into that particular area once in a while but we are like like giving importance to the other important things like the plexiform architecture and the atypia so here obviously the cells are more atypical compared to what we have seen priorly they are hyperchromatic there is coarseness to that particular chromatin they have got irregular contours there is also a bit of a pleomorphism if you see with the range of cells going all the way from small to the very large okay so mitosis are we seeing mitosis over here two yes sir okay so in the context of a peripheral nerve sheet tumor especially in a neurofibromatous background if you see mitosis it is worrisome any mitosis would be a worrisome feature there are two in this field so obviously we are dealing with a low grade mpnst transformation of a of a plexiform neurofibroma so that's an important 
change which can be seen it, uh, uh, like with this long standing plexiform neurofibromas basically so basically when you get a plexiform neurofibroma the important thing is to sample 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 as much as possible within the uh, uh, like uh, i mean grossly within this plexiform elements if you see areas which are relatively more firm sample from those areas because otherwise they should not give you that kind of a firm nature they will have that kind of slightly glistening white kind of an appearance which is not that firm or solid so if you get such areas know that you are probably having an empyreistic in the background another very important thing i don't have an uh, i don't have this ihc for this particular case i mean they had not put it up basically but it would be nice to see uh, if you see this particular plexiform nodules towards the top bottom as well as towards the right can you see that the right one is really not that well formed in fact there seems to be a blending with the adjacent stroma and if you see at the center the stromal cells they seem to be having like some kind of spindle cell elements which don't which look clustered and which don't look to be a part of the stroma at the center yes okay so yes sir so this is basically your plexiform nodule which is given way and the cells have spilled over into the stroma so if you have done an asunder and if you show positivity within those cells in the stroma that also is a strong clue to the malignant process escaping from this plexiform nodules and going into the stroma just like in the case of a follicular lymphoma where the cells would jump out from the follicles into the intrafollicular space like that see even within the plexiform nodules within this stroma aren't you seeing all those kind of shawny and slightly spindly cells which don't look like fibroblasts yes okay so this is basically mm -hmm. the infiltrating elements basically and as under mm -hmm. would have been beautiful to watch in this particular case but unfortunately this we don't have it we'll have to go by the morphology so again busy slide we'll just talk about the main points neurofibroma conventionally so conventionally you won't have a problem it will be a localized cutaneous neurofibroma it is the diffuse and the plexiform types that we need to be worried about especially in the settings of a neurofibroma 1 i mean neuro neuro uh, like neurofibromatosis 1 ihc s100 and sox10 will be positive in a patchy fashion in the case of the deep seated one sometimes and because this uh, like overall cellularity is less in the case of a superficial neurofibroma you will not get as intense positivity as you get in the case of a schwannoma ema might sometimes be positive as we as we know neurofibroma is basically a combination of schwannian cells along with fibroblasts along with perineural cells so you can expect s100 with sox10 as well as cd34 plus ema positivity everything can be seen in this particular group of tumors diffuse type this will be more deep there will be more infiltrative the cells will be more more rounded rather than spindle they will entrap the adipocytic elements and the skeletal muscle bundles pseudo mesenchymal bodies is something which is seen it looks like mesenchymal corpuscles basically i haven't got a picture you can look up i think it's given in the books so that's something that you see in the case of a diffuse neurofibroma plexiform as we have seen is characteristically plexiform nodules which which go all the way down into the deep into the deep subcutaneous tissue you need to watch out for malignant transformation within this plexiform nodules with features like a hypercellularity along with atypia and mitotic axis this is very important for the pgs whenever you get a schwannoma or neurofibroma or any other peripheral nerve sheet tumor the first question automatically boils down to what is the difference between a schwannoma and neurofibroma starting from the gross and going into the microscopy schwannomas are mostly situated in the head and neck and in the flexor extremities neurofibromas don't have any such regional kind of a predilection both can occur in deep kind of locations so that's not a feature encapsulation is seen in the case of schwannoma it is usually not seen in the case of neurofibroma antony a antony b will be seen in the case of schwannoma not in the case of neurofibroma what about the syndromes nf1 in the case of neurofibroma in the case of schwannoma usually they don't have any syndromes if rarely they can be sometimes seen in the case of neurofibromatosis 2 or very rarely in the case of neurofibromatosis 1 s100 and sox10 in the case of schwannoma will be strongly positive in the case of neurofibroma because of the less cellularity there will be variable kind of staining plus ema and cd34 will also get will also get picked up malignant transformation is exceptionally rare in the case of schwannomas in the case of neurofibromas it's known exceptionally especially in the case of neurofibromatosis 1 so this is the important differential diagnosis the most important differential diagnosis is in the case of a plexiform neurofibroma and in a deep neurofibroma for the deep neurofibroma your main issue is a dfsp as you have seen it's all entrapping the adipocytic elements going in a haphazard fashion it's small non descript sometimes rounded you will have an issue with the dfsp which is why you should always add cd34 along with your s100 and sox10 panel and mpnst because sometimes mpnsts can also present in that fashion 
So you will need to look out for things like mitotic access. Also, do not forget that there are settings where you will get a plexiform neurofibroma with MPNST. So that's another issue. And as we know, desmoplastic melanoma is always an issue if you have a deep-seated, slightly neural kind of a tumor going deep down. So that's to be kept in the back of the mind, especially in the skin. Now coming to perineuroma. Perineuroma is a benign peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Basically, uh, it's not that common. But the thing is, if it is seen, you will not make a mistake simply because this is one of the other prototypical examples of a story from pattern. The first story from pattern that we have seen is the case of DFSP, which we do not miss simply because we can identify a story from pattern. So one clue is if you get a cutaneous superficial lesion, which looks like a bland spindle cell kind of a proliferation. And if you see a kind of a storyform pattern and it's not fitting into the DFSP, probably you are having a perineuroma, as you will see subsequently. So here you have the overlying epidermis. You are having the dermis, which is free. Deep dermis, there is a very well circumscribed, almost an encapsulated kind of a tumor. So this is the conventional perineuroma. Over here, just appreciate the fact that it is well circumscribed. And now going within, you can see that the cells are in the, arranged in the form of holes. And also a vague kind of a story form pattern, which I'll show at a subsequently at a higher power. Doesn't it look some, give a kind of a vague kind of a story form appearance at places, as if twisted around a central point? Yes, at places, story form. Yeah, story form and holes. That is, I mean, that seems to be the common architecture over here. So that hold appearance and the story form pattern is characteristic of this group of tumors. So, so see here, it's one central spoke like region with a kind of a, peripheral kind of a story form formation. Okay. And here where the collagen has mostly replaced the tumor, the story form pattern is becoming more obvious actually. Okay. No. So over here you have it in a kind of a more cellular fashion as intersecting fascicles that can also be seen. But whatever we are seeing, the cells are bland. The cells are very uniform, monomorphic. They don't have much of hyperchromasia, pleomorphism, or mitotic axis. Over here, again, one region which was story form. The cells are bland. We don't have to worry much looking into the cells. They don't look Schwannian either. They don't look that uh, like that kind of wavy zigzag. They look slightly fibroblast-like, if we think. Okay, at these places, maybe they're slightly zigzag, kind of a Schwannian kind of a look. EMA. EMA is the important marker for perineural cells, like we know. So if you do EMA, they will be strongly positive in this particular group of tumors. Nice internal control for the first years. You don't need an external control if you do an EMA on such a case. We have got the epidermis, which has nicely come out to be positive. So this is a working IHC, which shows a good EMA positivity in a membranous fashion in these cells. So strong EMA positivity and S100 negativity would be a pointer to it being a pure pure peri, uh, perineuroma and not a hybrid tumor. Hybrid schwannomas along with perineuromas are also known to exist. They are pretty common actually. This is a sclerosing perineuroma. This is an extension of the same tumor where because of the excessive amount of sclerosis, the cells as such become inconspicuous. And what you are seeing is there's a lot of collagen, there's a lot of pink, but the cells, they have almost narrowed down to this kind of, can you make out this kind of intersecting trabeculae? narrow trabeculae which are going and anastomosing yes. yes so they are not spindle actually if you work your way see this trabeculae basically if you work your way you'll see that it's all rounded right the spindling has gone off probably because of the compression probably because of the compression these cells look more rounded rather than spindled there's a lot of collagen formation around these cells and they're bland so there's a sclerosing pain. You EMA you will have to do and just pick up a beautiful positivity within this cell population. There can be extreme examples where the cells are all gone. You are just left with collagen. So there you can have an issue of a hyalinized neurofibroma. But then you see these areas like can you can you make out the story form architecture over here within the collagen? Yes. yes. Okay, so there are areas which looks uh, which look kind of story form. It cannot be as uh, it cannot be a story form fibrohistiocytic tumor because you don't get to see much other like elements like the secondary lymphocytes, plasma cells, hemosiderin, etc. So it's just pure collagen along with the story form pattern and no cells. So there are cells which are preserved here and there. So you could do a EMA and if they turned out to be positive in those cells, you could give a diagnosis of a of a of a of a collagenized kind of a 
I mean, perineuroma. Intraneural perineuroma is something which happens within the nerve bundles, but, but it involves the same compartment. So here you get this onion bulb formation within the nerves, basically. This kind of hypnosis is very uncommon. I haven't seen one in my practice. So you will often get hybrid tumors, which you cannot put directly as a perineuroma or as a schwannoma. They don't have a proper veroke body. They don't have anterior A, anterior B, but at the same time, they don't have all the features of, a, of, of this perineuroma either. So in this particular case, this particular group is known to exist, hybrid perineuroma schwannoma. It does not really change as far as your prognosis is, is, is concerned. It's a benign tumor anyway, but it would be good in this particular case, you are getting collagen, you are getting this kind of non-descript cells, which are seen in the background, could be anything. But again, slightly vague zigzag kind of an appearance to the nucleus, which give an idea that probably it might be something Schwannian. Slightly zigzag if you see here and there. Okay, slightly wormy. So it would be a good idea to do an S100 and, and this EMA at the same time. So S100 as well as EMA have picked up positivity in this particular group of tumors in the same cell kind of a population. So probably it's a hybrid tumor, which is also known to exist. So that's it. The site is usually in the hands and the fingers, usually in the males, very well circumscribed tumor of a small size. You get predominantly a story form and a whole fashion, but also sometimes fascicles, very non-descript, thin fibroblast like cells, but at places wavy. And you have got these variants. EMA is a very important marker. Claudine 1, GLUT1, we talk about all that. We don't use it routinely in our diagnostics. So, but these are all markers which are expressed in this pain neural cell. CD34 can be variably positive. Hybrid nerve sheet tumors, as I've said, they're known to occur. So not really an issue if you do both. ISC for S100 as well as EMA, if both are positive, you can call it a hybrid nerve sheet tumor. Schwannomas will be usually encapsulated. These don't have it. Antony A and Antony B regions will be seen. Those will not be seen over here. Neurofibromas usually have less cellularity compared to what is seen in the case of a perineuroma. Granular cell tumor. This is a spotter. This is a spotter for the PGs. They will not give you any history. They will just give you this particular tumor. So granular cell tumor is something which you are supposed to identify morphologically itself. So here I'm just giving a bit of a history, probably a, trunk, uh, probably a tongue growth, which has been uh, it's a uh, it's having a history of say probably growing over a period of a few months and when it has been excised you see that the skin overlying skin is normal but then lower down you have this entrapment of these muscle bundles by a process which we are not able to make out it just looks pink basically and it looks like it's all individual packets and sheets which are gone and infiltrated the elements going at a higher power this is basically a nerve bundle which has been caught in a cross section which has been caught in a transverse section you get the individual nerve fibers which are caught in transverse section as small rounded structures and here you are having the peri the peri perineurium and you are seeing that these particular elements these tumoral elements are entrapping these nerve elements how will you describe these tumoral elements they're very large very polygonal granular cytoplasm with a nucleus which has got a bit of a vesicular chromatin with a prominent nucleus and that's how a granular cell will look basically this also is a description which applies in the case of adult adult skeletal muscle cells as we have seen in the case of adult type rhabdomyoma okay so these have an overlook uh, i mean so these have an overlap kind of a morphology and as you see there's a nice striated skeletal muscle bundle which has got entrapped by these elements by these tumoral elements so these abundant granular cytoplasm, polygonal cells are your, are your tumor cells. This is another case. This is for the seniors. This is basically one of the important problems. I guess we know what I, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I'll just uh, show the top of this field. This is a granular cell tumor. But if you look at the epidermis, most of the time what will happen is sometimes in a tongue biopsy, you will get just a portion. The clinician sometimes does not even bother about something like a granular cell. They will think more on the lines of a squamous lesion. They will probably give you a superficial kind of a biopsy and then expect a diagnosis from you. And then you will see, are you seeing this kind of infiltrating squamous elements which are going deep down like tongues, which are separate from the main squamous element? Yeah, pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia. Pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia. So just imagine, had you been given a small superficial biopsy with this top, in which probably your granular cell elements are not probably seen over here, probably a few clusters here and there. 
so in that case it's always important to go back to the clinical history and make some kind of a correlation pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia is something which is very common with this group of tumors and often they will get mistaken as squamous cell carcinoma so that's one important practice point as far as these tumors are concerned so again because of this small kind of ness some people might call it a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma but again as you are seeing these granular elements have gone all the way towards the top right this ness yes. so if you are having even this part even this top half you should be able to give the diagnosis or at least suggest the diagnosis and ask for s100 so again the same cells granular cells polygonal abundant granular cytoplasm prominent nucleolus vesicular chromatin s100 will be strongly positive in this cells now coming to a entity known as congenital granular cell tumor congenital granular cell tumor has been grouped along with this thing simply because of the fact that it looks like a granular cell tumor however it does not share any kind of ihc similarity with the usual granular cell tumor it is s100 negative actually only for the fact that it looks like a granular cell tumor has it been included in this particular description again it's in the congenital age group you have these packets of cells with abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm but what you are seeing is on top of that you are getting this prominent vascularity right in between these packets you are getting a very prominent vascular element so this prominent vascularity is also is one added thing which is seen in the case of a congenital granular cell tumor but otherwise the cells look pretty polygonal with abundant granular cytoplasm just what you would expect to see in the case of a adult type of granular cell tumor okay with the same kind of a nucleus vesicular nucleus with a pinpoint to prominent nucleolus s100 is negative within this cells what are these cells which have been picked up uh, i'm not really sure probably the probably the i am not really sure actually you will probably just go through the pictures and imagine what all cell types could show the positivity in this thing peripheral nerve sheath cells within the within that area showing s100 positivity or something in the pericytic component which shows a positivity i'm not really sure so granular cell tumor that's all we have talked about all these things uh, the site the head and neck region is a very common site especially in the tongue and the oral cavity so keep that in mind they look very infiltrative so they will give you the idea of a they will give you the impression of a malignancy keep that in mind because they go in and trap everything they entrap nerve bundles they entrap skeletal muscle elements uh, you will think of a malignancy but keep in mind that this is one particular tumor where this all these features are very well known uh you will go by the abundant granular cytoplasm by the polygonal morphology you will ask for a s100 along with sox10 the usual markers in the peripheral nerve sheath they will come out positive all the other markers that you do like as in the case of melanoma also your macrophage markers will be negative in this particular case nuclear tfe3 is one very important thing i put it just for the sake that nowadays many labs have almost the entire range of ihc at the disposal so even low level markers like tfe3 and all might be finding their way into some of the labs so if you what would you have had in mind if you had ordered a tfe3 in this particular type of a tumor in the head and neck with such abundant polygonal cytoplasm with a prominent nucleolus probably an alveolar soft part sarcoma because sometimes the solid component of an alveolar soft part sarcoma that is also a very well known tumor which occurs in the head and the neck region actually so the very solid element will not have the alveolar architecture they will have them in nests and they will also have that exactly same look the amorphous abundant granular cytoplasm with a prominent nucleolus so you will probably go ahead and do a i mean do this particular novel marker and then probably sign it out as that nuclear tfe3 is known to be expressed in this particular tumor in most cases so that's one very important diagnostic pitfall that needs to be kept in mind so that is the number one differential actually if you are not given a history and alveolar soft part sarcoma especially the solid component those are usually deep and they are usually much more larger and usually you will often get an alveolar component you will have nests but the cells will look as if they are falling apart and you will have a alveolar like architecture within that element itself we will talk about that particular tumor in detail when we go to the un the unspecified lineages basically uh, s100 protein and s100 uh, and the sox10 will be negative so that's an important clue nuclear tfe3 will be positive in both rhabdomyoma because they look like skeletal muscle cells adult adult rhabdo rhabdomyoblasts so they have kind of homogeneous eosinophilic granular cytoplasm polygonal cells but they will express desmin myogen in my myo d1 and they will be negative for s100 uh there is this entity known as primitive polypoid granular cell tumor which i basically just got from this diagnostic 
uh, from the diagnostic pathology series. I've not seen that. I just put it for the sake of completion. Maybe you can read up about it later. Dermal nerve sheath myxoma. This is a very interesting tumor. This is a tumor which is in the CMEs. They will put it out as a slide, as a spotter, or as a quiz question, and then some very enthusiastic PG will go jumping with this particular diagnosis because it is something like that. It is very striking if you see. So basically, you will have a dermal papule, you will have a dermal papule to kind of a nodular lesion. And the size is deceptive actually because once you excise the thing, it, it goes quite deep down compared to what idea you would have had if you saw it just from the outside. So once you see, it gives a kind of a plexiform lobular architecture, right? It looks like there are multiple <laughs> plexuses and kind of lobules going all the way, right? Going from the top to the bottom. Plus, it gives a very kind of a mixoid look. Okay, so these two things, this nodular architecture plus the mixoid look should be enough as a spotter. This can be kept as a spotter actually, this nerve sheet mixoma. So this is characteristic appearance and then you see within this plexiform nodules, within this kind of lobules, you see that there's a population of cells which are very bland, which are very innocuous within that mixoid background. They look spindled, but then at the same time, they also have a stellate kind of a cell population. Both the cell types can be seen actually. The spindle to stellate, but they're bland, they're innocuous. The important thing is that there is a differential diagnosis for this. These are called dermal nerve sheath myxomas, and those things that come in the differentials are known as neurothechiomas. If you remember, we have already covered that in the fibrohistiocytic tumor category, neurothechiomas. Okay, these also give the idea of a very kind of a plexus like kind of a nodular pattern, but the cellularity in a neurothechioma is much more compared to a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. A problem might happen if there is a neurothechioma with very prominent myxoid change. So in such cases, as you can see, as the picture shows, right, there's a lot of overlap between the two. On the left, you have got the dermal nerve sheath myxoma. On the right, you have got the neurothechioma with your myxoid change, right? There's a lot of similarity yes, between the two. So that is your differential diagnosis. Basically, this particular tumor has got only one DD and that is that other group of tumors. So just for completion, I will again go about that particular tumor again. So we are just skipping back to the fibrohistiocytic tumors into the conventional neurothechioma category, cellular neurothechioma, we call it. So basically, you have got the same kind of nodules, except that there is less of mixture change and there is more of cellularity within these nodules. These are mostly found in the head region. So as you see, this kind of pattern nodules with the cells growing within them, within the nests. As you see, they are more rounded to avoid. But the mixoid appearance is striking, even within these nodules. Even though they are cellular, the background is mixoid, even within the zones of cellularity. Right? We can appreciate the mixoid appearance. But we also appreciate the fact that the cells are not really spindled. They are more ovoid to rounded, which applies as in the case of, we know fibrohistiocytic tumors will often show a rounded appearance compared to the conventional spindle forms. So that is how they would look. They would look like kind of dissecting through the dermis uh, as kind of nodules, anastomosing nodules sometimes. Again, this particular fashion, almost like a granular cell tumor kind of a fashion. Again, you have to look for the mixer change within these nodules and appreciate the fact that they are not really spindled. They are more rounded uniformly. The cellular ones will cause a problem because sometimes you won't be able to appreciate the nodularity. And uh, so within this population, I mean, within this nest, you are seeing this particular population of cells, rounded cells, which are again bland. But the important thing is that even in that particular group, you can get atypia. Within a conventional neurothechioma, you can get atypia, you can get mitosis. Those are not prognostically important. So that's one important thing to be kept in mind in that particular family of tumors. You will only have a problem with a dermal nerve sheath myxoma versus a mixoid cellular neurothechioma. If it's showing extensive mixoid change like here. And because of the abundant amount of mixoid change, the cells have got slightly changed into a spindle to stellate kind of a morphology, which mimics that of a nerve sheath myxoma. So that's the only important differential as far as the dermal nerve sheath myxoma is concerned. In the case of neurothechioma, you have got this novel marker known as NKIC3 and CD10 will also be positive, S100 will be negative. So that's all. In the case of a diffuse nerve sheath myxoma, sight is important. Usually it's in the fingers and the hands, whereas the conventional neurothechioma is usually on the head, usually in the forehead. So that's one important thing. Plus S100 will help you 
along with the fact that the cellularity over here is less compared to what you are having over here. So this is the main differential diagnosis, neurothecuma with mixer change. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Now it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Coming. To, okay. So coming to the last entity of this chapter. The, so this is a big one, malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. This is often people say that this is not, you cannot diagnose it histologically. You need ISC and even ISC will not help you, etc. But I will show you a few clues, but I mean, by which you can strongly suggest a possibility of an MPNST. Of course, at the end of the day, MPNST remains the diagnosis where you will have to have a lot of correlation. As you know, you will have to have MRI imaging findings. You will have to talk with the clinician to find out whether these arrows from a major nerve trunk or whether the patient is having neurofibromatosis one, those are important things that need to be kept in mind. But histologically, even these tumors will give you a range of findings, which will help you to suggest an MPNST. So as you see, this is a tumor, which is situated deep down. Almost it looks like it arose from probably a plexiform neurofibroma and then has undergone a kind of a high grade transformation into a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. So very, very cellular are these regions. So when you work your way into these high cellularity nodules, you will see that there's a lot of intersecting fascicles and very, very, it's very, very cellular basically compared to what we have seen priorly in the case of the benign peripheral nerve sheet tumors. The cells are also not very, they are not very uniform. They are hyperchromatic. They also show some amount of pleomorphism. Now, these are the slides in which I will show you the important features by which you can more or less suggest and uh, that this is probably an MPNST. Now, do you see the variable cellularity over here? It looks like there are zones which, are, which have got no cells and there are zones in which the cells are concentrated, hypo and hypercellular. Yes. yes. Whenever in a case of a spindle cell sarcoma, especially a low grade spindle cell sarcoma, if you see alternating zones of hypocellularity and hypercellularity, this is known as the marble defect. And this is characteristically often seen in the case of MPNST, sometimes can be seen in the case of a synovial sarcoma, not many other tumors which can show this particular change actually. So have an MPNST when you see this kind of a morphology. So yes, so we are having these zones of alternating hypo and hypercellularity, basically lots of proliferations of these spindle cell elements within the hypercellular zones. Again, are you able to make out the fact that there are areas where there are less cells and where there are more cells? It gives a vague kind of a nodular area where appearance where there are more cells the other areas are pale hmm. okay so it can be it can be as uh, as conspicuous as this or as you know uh, or as inconspicuous as this but still you get the feeling that there's a kind of an alternating zone of hypo and hypercellularity so this is how the so these cellular zones look like this now i am coming to the next important clue Okay, in the cellular zones, you have them going as kind of intersecting fascicles here and there. But if you see the cells as such are bland, they don't give you much of an idea of atypia at this power. Usually if it is quite atypical, then even at a scanner view, you get the idea that the cells are not going to be uniform. Here it looks like they are going to be pretty much uniform as is seen at a higher power. So MPNST is something in which you often will not get a huge amount of atypia, just as in the case of synovial sarcoma. Synovial sarcoma is also known where there is things like mitosis, etc., but you don't get much of atypia. I mean, just like in this particular case. So MPNST is first thing. Okay. The, uh, so this was the first pattern that I said, kind of a marbleized, kind of a alternating hypo and hypercellular pattern with the second pattern of intersecting fascicles and diffuse sheets. Now coming to the next pattern, are you able to put a name to it? Okay, does it look like there are small blood vessels around which the tumor cells seem to be accentuating yes. themselves? Okay, so perivascular accentuation. Yeah, yeah, perivascular accentuation, but there has to be a name. So this is the first time that I saw and appreciated this pattern actually. I was just going through the virtual slides and then I knew that if I go to Enzinger, I will get the answer. That is one gem of a book. I mean, all WHO books notwithstanding, I'll say if you want to do good in soft tissue pathology, uh, read the, the entire Enzinger from the top to bottom. It will give you some kind of classifications which are a bit iffy. They don't match that of the WHO, but as far as patterns goes, he is the boss. So I just walked my way to Enzinger and there was this beautiful picture given in the MPNST. Does it not look the same? Yes. 
and so this particular yes, pattern yes. Uh, so this particular pattern is known as the curly q pattern i have never heard of this particular pattern before I and i've yeah and i've not seen this thing in any other particular group of tumors so it's mentioned over there so that is one more pattern for you to keep in your mind of the patterns so this is one uncommon pattern which can be seen in this particular group of tumors uh, so there are some other important things which you sometimes see over here. You sometimes tend to get hyalinized cords around which these cells seem to accentuate around these cords. You get those, I mean, just like we saw in the day, uh, in the case of low-grade fibro, fibro mixer sarcoma, you tend to get hyaline kind of rosettes. Even in these cases, sometimes you can get hyalinized rosettes. Again, one big zone of necrosis. For the first years, this is how you will identify necrosis. You'll see a busy kind of a cellular tumor and all of a sudden you see a zone where there are no cells and where there look to be dots within these zones. Those are basically areas which have got necrosed and the peripheral zone of cells which are preserved give, a, I mean, give an appearance of accentuation peripherally. So this is an area of necrosis. So whenever in the setting of a soft tissue sarcoma, if you get this kind of coagulative necrosis, you know that it is bad. So that's one another important thing to be kept in mind. So this is the zone of coagulative necrosis where you can obviously make out that the tumors have undergone necrosis. This is the tumor cell population and here you are getting the ghost nuclei which are present within these necrotic zones. So these are proper tumoral necrosis that you see, coagulative necrosis. See? For the first years, this is how you will appreciate tumoral necrosis. You have a preserved cell and then you have these cells which are almost like going, going and then gone. Just the vague remnant of the nucleus which is left behind. Okay. This is something which was shared by one of my contacts on on my LinkedIn, basically. So he had an interesting case which he showed. And this thing I basically picked up from his case. This particular pattern is also another very interesting pattern. It's called the peritheliomatous pattern. What happens is because sometimes these cells are very, very metabolically active and they don't get much of blood supply, the cells which are around the vessels tend to survive, whereas the rest of the tumor undergoes necrosis. So what you have is a perivascular sustentacular pattern. Cells which are preserved, especially around the blood vessels. This And this type of pattern is also characteristically seen in the case of Ewing sarcoma. So just keep that in mind. So this peritheliomatous pattern of necrosis is also something that can be sometimes seen in the case of a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Again, sometimes you will try to see into the cells whether that gives you an idea of a Schwannian nature, like kind of a spindle cell peripheral nerve sheet. So you have cells which look slightly zigzag kind of an appearance. So it's probably of a Schwannian origin. Again, the cells are very, so this area is very, very cellular. The cells are almost sitting on top of each other. There is also some amount of pleomorphism and some amount of hyperchromasia. Mitosis, I guess we are seeing over here. So in the, so in the context of a peripheral nerve sheet tumor, if you are seeing mitosis, obviously it is malignant. So that's important. Buckled nuclei, if you are seeing, that's another added clue that you are probably having a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Here, the cells are obviously pleomorphic. Where and there, they, and there they will not have any resemblance to the Schwann cells. At places, they can even give you an epithelioid kind of an appearance. Poorly differentiated areas can be seen in such tumors. Coming to the third important point, which will help you to identify malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, and this is very important. These are things that I don't think they're very often stressed in your books like Ackerman. So you'll need to go into a specialized surgical pathology text for these things, actually. So Enzinga talks about it beautifully. You see, if if you see, this is a blood vessel basically. And if you see these tumor cells, they appear to be working their way through the wall of the blood vessel and almost going to the side of the vessel. But if they were given a chance, they would have almost jumped into the lumen. It, it kind of looks like, right? If you see? Yes. So yes, this, yes. Yeah. So mm. this kind of herniation, this kind of herniation of the tumor cells into the vascular lumen, you don't get to see in any other spindle cell sarcoma. If you get to see that, you can definitely have an idea of an MPNST and you can ask for those markers yeah, and even ask for an exclusion of those things. I'll show you some more of those things. So there is this particular blood vessels. There is a bit of sound from some somebody's mic. So you can just turn off the mic. Okay, so you are having a bit of proliferation of these tumor cells and accentuation within the wall of the vessel. Okay. So here, you see, these particular tumor cells appear as if they're going into the vascular wall, perivascular accentuation. Again, perivascular hypercellularity. Answer in the uh, beautifully seen. Uh, somebody's, somebody's mic is making a lot of noise, so please turn it off. Mm -hmm. 
ஆயிஷா ஹாஸ்பிட்டல் வந்து மோஷன் தேட்டர் தெரியுமா sound? Yes. No, okay. So. Okay. So there's a bit of a herniation of this particular tumor cells into the vessel lumen. As you can see, these large vessels in which there's a perivascular accentuation of this tumor. So that's very characteristic actually of this particular group of tumors. This was another case. This is another case in which, basically, just to show again, you are having these alternating zones, right? You are having less cellular areas. You are having more cellular areas. Yes. Pale, mm. pale and blue, pale and blue. So that's one very important thing that we need to keep in mind as far as the soft tissue sarcoma is concerned. Whenever you have such a look, keep that as one of your probabilities. So again, whenever you have that pale and blue, the next thing is to go into the vessels and see if there is a bit of a perivascular herniation or not. So if you see this kind of appearance where the cells are almost herniating into the lumen, you are more or less sure that you are probably dealing with an MPNST. This is a curiosity, just as in the case of DFSP, we have seen that there can be melanocytic differentiation as in the case of a Bednar tumor. So this MPNST is sometimes known to undergo differentiation into rhabdomyoblasts. As you see, large polygonal cells with abundant cytoplasm. So these are rhabdomyoblasts. So MPNSTs are known to undergo differentiation in a heterologous fashion. If they undergo rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, it is known as a malignant triton tumor. There's a name for that. So as you see, this run, uh, so this nice rounded kind of a cell. So here we are seeing two features. We are seeing herniation of the tumor cells into the vessel wall, plus we are seeing the abdomenoblastic differentiation. Coming to the IHC, if you are doing S100 and SOX10, keep in mind that you don't expect to see strong positivity. You will expect to see a patchy positivity, and even that will be faint. And that is how MPNSTs will behave as far as IHC is concerned. You will not get diffuse positivity like is seen in the case of a schwannoma. Okay, so again, busy one. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, keep in mind that if it's a patient of neurofibromatosis one, chances are that there will be a plexiform neurofibroma component which has undergone a transition to an MPNST. So that's one thing to be kept in mind. These are known to undergo local recurrence and very high chance of distant metastasis, especially to the lungs, bone, and to the pleura. That's an important thing. They'll often be large. They will appear variegated just like any other high-grade soft tissue sarcomas. What are the histological clues you look for? You look for the marble pattern, the alternating zones of hypo and hypercellularity. You look for the perivascular hypercellularity. And you will, if you are getting it, the perithelomatous pattern is very helpful. And apart from that, check for rhabdomyoblasts if it is present or not. And ISC, if you order, don't expect a diffuse positivity. It will be focal. And this is the one that the PG should know. Again, like I'm saying, H3, K27M, ME3. This is a nuclear IHC marker, which is lost in the case of MPNST and is preserved in the case of the benign entities. So that's one thing, just like INI1. This is one of those new negative markers. So what are the differential diagnoses? As we see, it's a low grade spindle cell proliferation. So any low grade spindle cell sarcoma will come into a differential. The number one being your, uh, the, so the main one is your monophasic synovial sarcoma. Okay. So in the case of a monophasic synovial sarcoma, usually you will get hemangioparacetamol like vessels. That's one thing. Plus you will often get calcifications also. Plus look for areas which is slightly more epithelioid, slight gland forming area. All, all those are soft clues. Ask for your CK, EMA, BCL2, CD19, etc. S100 positivity might sometimes lead you astray because focal positivity can also be seen over there. Diffuse nuclear TLE positivity is something you see in the case of synovial sarcoma, not in this case. And obviously a fish for translocation exit it if you want to rule it out finally. Cellular schwannomas can sometimes cause a problem. Cellular schwannomas will not have that much of mitosis. Even that kind of tumoral necrosis is not known in the case of cellular schwannoma. Plus look for all those other soft clues that I said, the alternating zones of hypo and hypercellularity, then your, your perivascular accentuation. Okay, those kind of things. And of course, your S100 will be, will be very, very helpful because in the case of cellular schwannomas, it will be strongly positive, S100 and SOX10. In this case, it will be patchy. And, and H3K27N will be retained in the case of cellular schwannomas. It will not in the case of MPNST. Melanoma is something which always needs to be kept in the mind. Now, uh, we had talked about that yesterday. 
a liposarcoma an atypical lipomatous tumor but well differentiated liposarcoma which has undergone dedifferentiation to an mpnst like area can be in your differential in which case you will have to search for lipoblasts one thing and second you will have to ask for an mdm2 and cdk4 ihc and if you are still worried you will have to ask for a fish for the mdm2 amplification so that's another important thing leiomyosarcoma usually you will not have a problem because the cells as you know you have seen those cells there are usually more elongated uh, more blunt ended they look more like cigar shaped with more abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm so that actually should not come as a part of your differential but still if you want to exclude you can do sma caldesmon etc last entity of the group is a variation within the epithelioid uh, i mean within this mpnst category which is a very well known entity epithelioid mpnst it is rare i could not find images so i basically just i'm taking that from enzinger so it shows a vaguely nodular growth pattern and within this nodules also can you make out these alternating zones of hypo and hypercellularity so this hypocellular mixoid with alternating hypercellular zones are kind of retained across all types of mpnsts that's one important clue so you have got these cords of epithelioid cells which are present within these hypocellular zones even these cells look epithelioid they look rounded polygonal they don't give you much of an idea of a spindle cell appearance so in a high grade kind of a soft tissue sarcoma which is epithelioid and if it is proximally located it can bring a whole lot of differentials into your issue which is not like the differentials that we have discussed before you will start worrying about epithelioid sarcoma of the proximal type you will start worrying about a rhabdoid tumor although a rhabdoid tumor does not usually go into the adult age group you will start thinking about a metastatic carcinoma you might think of a malignant myoepithelioma mane some kind of a myoepithelial carcinoma basically any entity which is away from the usual spindle cell soft tissue sarcoma so epithelial mpnst has that range of differentials so again epithelioid polygonal cells with clear to eosinophilic cytoplasm very prominent nucleolus mitotic activity in excess again you are seeing this epithelioid arrangement of the cells and some amount of mixoid change which is seen again can you make out this slight inclusion like areas dense pink eosinophilic areas next to the nucleus which is kind of eccentrically pushed out in the lower picture so this kind of rhabdoid morphology is often known to exist in the case of epithelioid mpnst so that so that rhabdoid morphology might sometimes carry you away but if you know that the rhabdoid tumor does not localize into the elderly age group like we are going to talk about so rhabdoid is once it is ruled out you will have to have a proximal type of epithelioid sarcoma versus a epithelioid mpnst as a differential along with your myoepithelial carcinoma things like that s100 so thankfully compared to a normal mpnst here s100 is very strongly positive so that's a very big clue however like rhabdoid tumor ini is not expressed in this particular group of tumors so again if you are not paying attention to the clinical details if you are just if you have all the markers at your disposal and if you are running an ini you might land with a wrong diagnosis of a rhabdoid tumor so that happens when we excessively use ihc without going into the morphology and correlating it with the clinical presentation so that's an important thing also keep in mind that ini is lost in the case of proximal types of epithelial sarcoma sometimes so that is also another thing the epithelial sarcoma needs to be ruled out by a combination of epithelial markers along with cd34 so cd34 will need to be a part of your panel in such epithelial high grade tumors in the proximal region so this is a distinctive subtype of mpnst which is characterized by strong diffuse s100 expression there is no association with neurofibromatosis 1 it is usually in the subcutis uh basically you have the sheets and nests of large epithelial cells with sometimes they can show a rhabdoid morphology and uh, strong diffuse s100 positivity and sox10 very very helpful nuclear ini expression can be lost just like rhabdoid tumor that's one important thing and unlike an mpnst here the nuclear positivity of h3k uh, i mean this particular h3k27 me3 is retained in this particular group of tumors so what are your differential diagnosis epithelial schwannoma usually does not come they have mentioned it so i put it over there because again the high grade nature and the infiltrativeness will kind of rule out a schwannoma that ruled out melanoma always has to be in our differential whenever it's a high grade especially with a prominent nucleolus like that so you will run melanocytic markers s100 and sox10 will only add to the confusion so you will have to put in your more specific melanocytic markers like hmb45 mart1 along with that thing myoepithelioma which is malignant is very much in the dd so you will and because they can also express s100 you will have to put in other myoepithelial markers at the same time sma gfap calponin etc 
So that's one important thing. EWS are translocations are known in that case. I don't know whether we are doing this fish for this thing routinely in such cases. Clear cell sarcoma sometimes can show this kind of an appearance uh, uncommonly. Epithelial sarcoma is something that needs to be kept in mind. So you will need to put epithelial markers along with CD, CD, CD34 also when you are doing it. Lymphoma sometimes something like a DLBCL if it is very, very diffuse. If you are not getting those organized packets, if it's a diffuse proliferation, you might think of a high grade NHL. So you will have a lymphoid marker also put into the thing. Epithelial angiosarcoma. Basically, it's so high grade and so poorly differentiated, it could be anything. You have to put a whole lot of markers into your panel, basically. But in an epithelial high grade soft tissue tumor, always also have an epithelial MPNST as one of your important differential diagnoses. So this was all about this particular group of tumors. Uh, tomorrow we'll be meeting around the same time for the polyps of the GIT. I have the NGO thing which is ready. So the vascular tumors I'll do some. I'll do sometimes next week. Sometimes after we have reached a consensus about the time, because I think next week there's a lot of PG activities, right? Which has been organized by Tata, and yes, uh, and and, week, and back to back and very very important ones. Flow cytometry ones. There are three, I think. So those are the most important things. If there is some time between, if we can squeeze some time we will do the we'll do the entire group of vascular tumors that's a big entity actually there's got many entities so it might be needed to be split into two sessions we'll find a time for that uh, and uh, after that we'll be probably taking a break i will be busy with some of my own work you can put in the topics that you need discussion that you think need discussion into the bulletin board over there we can work our way and find out one or two days per week or two or three days where you can make some kind of a makeshift presentation and then go over that particular entity. Okay. And as for those who have missed the first soft tissue discussions, if there is a consensus and the, if there is adequate number of people, then I can run those talks again. There, uh, so basically we have covered fibroblastic, biofibroblastic. We have done skeletal muscle and smooth muscle and we have done fibrohistiocytic. So if you are interested, you can put in a word in that comment box. We will find a time to have those sessions again. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, that in the so in that case, if there is no doubt or if there is no question, you can call it a night. Then stay safe, everyone. Okay, sir. Good night. Okay, thank you, Good sir. Night. Yeah, welcome. Good night.